conversation has all been about making things predictable, making things robust, making things uh, effectively operationally boring right, for people. And it, you know, what's really been interesting since the because uh, the, the, the conversations we had previously were before Cardano was launched, uh, how we've managed to achieve that goal of basically constructing a nice, boring operational system to, a, you know, to the level that most engineers would be very proud. It was, a really, it was actually a very interesting experience to sit there uh, with all the ops people as we, over 12 hours, prepped everything, got everything ready, had, you know, the stressful moments when somebody had mistyped something and we thought it was broken. The usual sort of you know, uh, you know, nail-biting moments, but which were all due to people being, uh, tired people making some minor errors, right? And then you launch this system. Um, you know, 90 odd nodes, run up, 45 minutes, and the whole thing comes alive, okay? Actually, you know, birth of a cryptocurrency must be one of those interesting experiences that you don't get to do very often. And then it was lovely and boring. Okay, it operated. It went through its actual users adding. Uh, you know, we got we got an initial surge of people joining the network. Uh, you know, we were panicking. Would it be hundreds of thousands? Would it be tens of thousands or whatever? And actually, all our sizing was generous. We've reduced the size of the number of nodes since then because it was a little bit too generous. And then into November, suddenly, the wallets triple. We have no idea to this day why so far. Um, it goes from 500 to 1500 in under 24 hours. A few little alarms go off. Uh, we work out what they mean. We, we learn how the system performs under stress better. And again, it remains boring. So I think the, what's, the thing that's been most striking about this is we in Cardano have actually starting to achieve the outcomes that we've been discussing today in this, um, in this conference, which is this issue of constructing complex systems that you can reason about their performance because performance is critical these days to the, it, to the integrity of the system, to its usability and to its cost effectiveness. Um, and those are the techniques with the, along with the formal methods um, and along with all of the auditing that we're doing in the developing of the, the Cardano um, whole ecosystem uh, that gives the, the long lived, the longevity um, and sustainability to what's being built. We've had we've had a great time today. We, we've we've gone over these issues of you know how to measure this this stuff of quality attenuation. You know you've all been extremely well engaged in thinking about what it means for the economics, the user experience, and everything else. And um, some of the questions being asked is how do I turn this this low level idea into a high level outcome and deliver something that's got useful and business value. Okay. So a lot of the stuff we did, I did at Delta Q and the original mathematics was actually at the turn of the century. Okay, so the, the, that's about 15 years old, or 17 years old. Uh, we haven't st stood still in that process, right? We've been refining it. And one of the things I want to talk to you today is about, not that, come on. Uh, why did you fall asleep? Please, thank you. Ah, uh, Peter. <laughs> I'm sorry, right, right. <laughs> right, this is, the, this is the nature of technology. Yeah, here we go. So one of the things that you have, to, one of the, is taking it up to that level whereby you can start to pull the application outcomes together, the notion of the risks and the hazards of not performing properly, right? And how you can start to both re reason about those and mitigate them. So this, this hits the safety critical communication side, but this is sort of a, this is, this is a critical communication and you know, if I was giving this talk uh, six months ago, I say it's a, it would be worth, you know, who knows. Uh, it, we'll say how much it's worth in a little while, okay? Right, so the first thing I need to do is give you a very, very brief and, and, and high-level view of what does it mean to have a blockchain. Lots of things have been said about them. What is a blockchain? Right, so the first thing is it's perfectly, you know, in, in the case of a permissionless one at least, it is a fully distributed ledger. It's about recording history. No rewriting history in this world, okay? There forever. And it's in a fully public purview, right? Everybody can see everything. Well, they can see what's in the ledger. They not, may not be able to interpret what that means entirely. That depends on how you've engaged in that process. And this ledger is built up with a new page being added to it every so often. 
and the, the later pages, it, it's possible to rewrite a page, but once you've got a few pages back, no way, right? The amount of energy or the amount of people you have to uh, put into a dark room and beat up or whatever becomes impossible to achieve. So it becomes increasingly immutable the further in time you go back. Each block references the previous block. This is how you create the history. And if there's a bunch of cryptographic functions and smarts inside that process, and that becomes hard to change. Right, and inside that block is transactions. It doesn't really matter what they were. They were movements of things, and those things could be tokens which you might associate a value with if you're really that weird and like cryptocurrencies, right? So what happens is a new block is minted, but mined, depending on your particular technology, by a leader who is chosen by either a race, which is what Bitcoin does, and using proof of work, or by, the random, by some form of random selection by consensus, which is what proof of stake does. The difference between these things uh, is this one. The race consumes, for every transaction, consumes the electricity of an average um, Dutch household for a month, around about 40 euros for each, of electricity for each transaction. Uh, whereas this one is, th this sort of one, if you were to measure it, the lower one is one, is, is five to six orders of magnitude smaller in energy consumption. Actually, complete resource consumption. Uh, you can pay for all of the compute at that price. Now, the problem is this. In the proof of stake, in these systems, what happens if a block arrives a little bit too late? First thing to say is the integrity of the system is not compromised because any transactions that sat, where is this button I'm looking for? Any transactions that sat in this block would get incorporated in future blocks. But the performance is affected, okay? Because basically you've wasted this amount of time in construction blocks. So we now have, we have an issue of, and if you can do, if you can kill off blocks, enough of them, you can start to make the ledger have a fairly, you know, some whole pages where no page was written, and things can start to get a bit awkward. It takes, there's a whole bunch of mathematical proofs as to how, of why this is very difficult to do, etc. All of which I believe, from the mathematical point of view, you've got to make the reality of the system correspond close enough to that mathematics so the mathematics actually holds, right? So the key issue that we, that, that we no, the key issue I'm trying to analyze here, what I'm not saying that is how quickly can I communicate these blocks, this block here, to the leaders so that, oops, so that it um, can be used for the next one to be built on. Does that make sense? The key temporal constraint is that block, these blocks have to arrive so the next one can build on it. Right? Very simple. Seems simple. So what you've got, so we, we've been talking about how you can turn this stuff into, um, you know, with business terms and monetary terms and all the rest of it. You've got transactions coming in from the outside world. You mint a block, you, you, you diffuse it to everybody else. Everybody incorporates back out, and you're going around this loop. Nice, simple loop, okay? And you've got a couple of, I would say, key performance metrics that the end user of these systems, which could be an end user making just a simple transaction or a bank moving a few billion between A to B, or it could be um, recording the fact that you've been issued a degree by a Greek institution, or it could be um, you know, a, 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 um, a land registry in a, third, in a country which doesn't have uh, such objects and but normal, who owns the land is who beat you up the last, right, and that type of thing. Um, so what you're typically looking for in, this, in the particular system, Cordano, that we're, we're using is after two to ten blocks, this is unchangeable, depending on how much risk you wish to take, right? You know, at 10 blocks, we're talking, you know, universe lifetimes of energy to, to undo the problems. So you're interested in how time it takes to become in the block and how quickly those blocks go so that the history can't be changed. And you're also interested in transactions per cycle, total debt, cycle time, throughputs, these types of things. And these all come down to, yes, you have to write the code, yes, the code's got to be efficient, they all come, there's a, there's a delta Q for minting a block, there's a delta Q for incorporating a block, which sit in the software, right? And there's a delta Q for diffusing the blocks. So, 
this talk, you know, this, today we've been talking about how that quality attenuation, how the performance characteristics of the systems work. Um, we're now talking about a system that is uh, intended to be of global scope, to be run with no centralised control, no centralised authority, and we wish to be able to build a system that we can rely on in those circumstances. All right, 50 pictures, a bit, bit more of exactly what's going on here. There's the bits that you want to incorporate, the old ledger and the bits you want to incorporate, the block minting. This send block is somebody has chosen to be the block leader, right, by a random consensus algorithm. Um, and th so that green one is one person. All these grey blocks at the bottom are all the other people who are interested in the system. We need to do this so that 99% of all the potential slot leaders get that block in time. And we're going around that loop every 20 seconds. Right? And we have been going around that loop every 20 seconds since the 1st of October. Okay? We've talked about the relationship, we know how the underlying performance of things, and, and we've talked about them in relation to you know, we need performance for people to do safety critical functions over things. We need performance so that we can manage costs, performance management in order to manage costs, etc. So one of the things that's really interesting about this approach is that there is not, because of the way these cyber currencies are viewed, is there should be no hegemony. There's no central authority who has any control here. Now, if something a telco thinks it has over its networks, it may only think this, uh, not actually be its actuality, it feels it has control. And governments think they have control over the things inside their estate. We're now building systems which are critical where no one has that control. We have to assume that bad actors exist, right? And those bad actors may range from script kiddies looking to find a fault in your software and steal, I think it was how many millions were stolen today by somebody from somewhere, uh, from Bitcoin, right, somebody found, right? Those things are being dealt with by formal proof and by formal analysis, by, by where th those are being looked at in those ways. It's the only approach, the only, uh, no one else is doing it with that rigor. But um, we're assuming that they can do things with the influence they can muster. So we're, not, we're doing this in the presence of adversaries. We have left the safety critical role of doing communications. We're now into battlefield communications, right? Which is a level up from, from what we were talking about earlier. Um, there's no fixed apology. Who owns the stake and therefore who should, will be elected the block leader, uh, whether they got their machine switched on or off is changing constantly, right? Imagine you're trying, now for those who are operators who build networks, Imagine that where your infrastructure is changing continuously and you're still supposed to provide a service, right? Um, and we can't fix a topology. Because if I fix a topology and say, you know, I'm always talking to Peter and that information becomes available, then that exposes a risk that can be used by bad actors, right? So you've got to have a sense of randomness of choice. I'm well, just trying to introduce the problem space. Hopefully, this is all sort of making sense. If you've ever built or thought about a complex system, these are the sorts of things that are going. We have found that we, no, we have to trust P IP at the moment, but actually we can't just trust TCP IP uh, or one TCP IP connection because basically it's too unreliable to do anything, even this critical on, because basically it has too many single points of failure, uh, or points of failure, and it's too slow to converge when things go wrong, right? And we were discussing earlier the notion of how um, companies are building their own SD-WANs, how uh, data centers are now making available their own inter-data center networks to try and resolve this. And Amazon last week launched exactly a product like that, where you can now connect all of their uh, internal virtual private clouds together globally, right? They're, they're now taking over the role that the traditional telcos did because basically they, there's a, they found a market opportunity. Right, so what I'm basically saying is normally we draw nice, pretty, fluffy clouds, right? And we have little clouds of clouds and that's the level to which people think these systems are at, right? Clouds of clouds. We can't deal with that. We can't, you know, clouds of clouds, we've got to walk away from the cloud. Right, because the cloud's got too much mist in it, and we can't see what's going on, and our feet get too wet. 
And we've got to start thinking about actually how we are connected to other neighbours. So we now have to think away from a cloudy thing where the cloud with its magical pixies and all its magical TCP engines will make everything good and proper for your application into something where you've actually got to take some responsibilities. Okay? Okay. So what, we're d what you're seeing here is I am connected, but I'm actually overlaying on top of what I've got some notion of connectivity. Right? I'm creating point-to-point -point links in order because I can't trust the cloud to do everything for me on time. Right? And this is where we were discussing earlier about issues of vertical markets doing other things, you know, do, going their own way. The, the trust isn't there, the delivery isn't there, therefore you have to construct um, some sort of overlay network. It's random. It has to be random, right? Because if I make it predictable, it becomes easy to disrupt, right? And, you know, depending on the, your threat model, easiness of disruption is, is a, a, an important th aspect. Um, and the threat models in this space are legion, right? Um, and really, you know, everything from large criminal gangs who want to pervert the way the, the chain is being worked to state actors who don't like the currency in their country to individual people ganging up on people they don't like because they were dissed in a, um, in a, in a chat, right? All of these things happen. Okay, but there's a problem with this is that topology is not topography, right? This lovely, pretty picture of all these things connected here doesn't actually capture what's essential to my problem. I've actually got to start worrying about how this is laid out in the real world. I have to count, right? It's laid out across the globe. I need to understand um, how, the, how, cl how close these things are, how quickly they can exchange messages in this ever-changing random graph. Right? Well, it's not ever changing. It is ever changing, but not necessarily massively fast, let's be honest. Here, okay? So suddenly you've now got to turn around and say, how do I construct systems that are not centralized, entirely autonomously run, in a random topology, which is changing relatively quickly, that is spread around the world and is exposed to the risks of direct attack uh, by adversaries and the risks of sort of correlated attacks by acts of nature, right? Like, you know, the, the North Atlantic Ridge moves and, the, or the, the, and basically half the fibres in the world get across the ridge get cut. That happened in the late 60s. Somewhere in my youth that happened, right? So it's not, uh, or we suddenly get a coronal mass ejection from the sun that basically causes us to have to shut down a third of the world before the electronics <coughs> get fried, right? And we all have to go back to the dark middle ages for about a week. Or if you're North America, six years. I refer you to a Lloyd's Register report about this, okay? So, right, global scale. So what, we've talked about the ability of Delta Q to measure. We've talked about it, about being able to manipulate things. What I'm talking about here now is about it capturing something, that which is the salient properties of the real world. <coughs> if I know the quality attenuation from A to B and B to C, Seated, you know, I can actually work out the quality attenuation from A to D from those pieces <coughs> of information. And if I know it going in the opposite direction, I can start working out how much it's going to cost me to move these data around, these pieces of data around. Okay? And that looks like a lot of information, but it's only one point of information per link. And this is you know, relatively simple to do in computational terms. But now what's happening is you're exploiting the mathematical properties of this stuff that you can convolve it, as Martin said in the very first slide, to do something useful to start helping you make decisions. Okay? So let me just simplify a small part here. One of the strange things you might find in networks is that, you know, if, you, if for those of you who've ever done anything like this, you, you build this large amount of connectivity, <coughs> which you then run a routing protocol on, which throws away most of the connectivity. Right? Because it forms a route. It basically takes the, the... Everybody says, well, everything's connected to everything at the lower layers, and most of that's not being used. Right? There's a huge cost in the system for those things just because your routing algorithms are, are, are basically tr pruning the things to a, a shortest path first or equivalent uh, system. 
So what is the best? Now, what I want to be able to do here is how do I calculate this? And, and the point is, with the delta u calculus, I can do this. I can work out which of the four possible routes, and it's a quick exercise for the reader, which of the four routes, yes, you can see them. Yeah, yeah, yeah good, right, you know, that's the obvious one. That's the obvious one, but there's also, right, and what's really interesting is the smallest number of hops does not imply the earliest time to delivery. So suddenly, sending the data off in one direction, which gives ports for more hops, actually gives you a better service. Right? This is one of the issues, and this is, this is stuff that, uh, and you think, of course it must, right? If you think about it, it depends on the delays. Right. That's important. Right, next slide. So you might think, okay, great. That sounds really nice, Neil. What does it mean? Here's a real example, right? I can't remember, so uh, I can tell you what some of these are. Uh, this is the, the time between Ireland and London, just here. Five milliseconds of, of G, 33 microseconds per, oct per octet of S, right? Here, here is, here's actually crossing the, going almost right around the world once as a single path. It takes 365 milliseconds with 148, right? These are numbers, you can construct matrices, you can actually start building numbers. So the, we've been talking what's the value for this stuff is the, really, the reason why I got involved, the reason why it's delta Q is the, partially the reason why delta Q is the way it is, is because actually, you know, as a computer scientist and a mathematician, I knew I needed something that would form an algebra. I knew I needed something that would actually made sense when you did arithmetic on it and composition on it. You cannot, I, I could not put bandwidths in this matrix because it doesn't make sense, right? But the fact that they, people don't, a lot of people don't understand the difference between a number and what that number means, right? So these are numbers that mean things and actually have appropriate properties and appropriate algebraic structures in order to do, say, matrices on them. Right. You're all being very quiet and very, well, thank you, thank you very much, but it's really good. So, the thing that what we are actually doing, so the thing that we're actually working on at the moment, okay, is we're taking this issue of measuring these delta Qs on a hop-by-hop -hop basis out of this random graph so that we can do something. And we're doing this, it's a local pairwise measure. So we're taking local information, no global, con no, this, remember, no global manager here. We're taking it to share that information regularly. There are issues to do with people lie, people might masquerade, all of which we are dealing with, understanding how we can, we're actually building models of trust of this metrics into these spaces. You can then calculate this, this, this magic matrix of how things move, and from that, work out the key piece of information, which is this, there. If I want to get from A to D, the route I go is to start at H. What you need is, you know, you know, it's the standard joke, you know, how do I get from somewhere to X, A to B, so you, right, well, I wouldn't start there from here if I was you, right? You need to go to the appropriate intermediate point to start. And what that means is we can actually, by doing this, know how long it will take those blocks to diffuse to the nodes in the system. And we're no longer trying to necessarily minimize the diffusion time. We're trying to minimize the the maximize the fraction that will get there in time. Back to the original objective is to maximize. It's the, the original objective is here we go, dunk, 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 dunk. Our original objective, which is, uh, is there. We're trying to avoid that very hazard. So that's the hazard we're trying to avoid, getting things done in time. And you might think, well, this is pretty technical, just, it's just a blockchain. But getting information to another pl uh, actor in a, in a space in time is the critical thing almost for everything we've discussed today, yeah? It's basically don't shoot that person in the battlefield, right? Uh, do do this uh, in an emergency. Here is the next block of data for you to see in your video demand, just before the buffer emptied, right? The people talk about delay, but what they really mean is they need the outcome of interest in the time frame that is suitable for their application. 
And all I'm describing here, at one level of abstraction, is that property. Yep. All right, let's get, sorry. Beautiful. Now, what's really interesting here is what Delta Q also tells you, which is probably a little bit mind-blowing, is how long it takes to get somewhere actually depends on its size. Right? So no longer is there a single best route. It depends on how big the object you're trying to move is, in, the, in this case. So you now, now end up with, I may have lots of possible connections, and I may have a routing protocol that will take all bar one of them out. And what's it stopping me is actually making the system more efficient. Because actually, if I have a small packet um, and I have a path that has a big S, uh, but, a, but um, a, a, a relatively small G, I can send it that way. If I have another path that has a bigger G, but a smaller S, there will be a size at which it is better to send it the other way. Right? Now, wait a minute. I've just, what we've just done there is said th the underlying infrastructure that we were, we'd ignored because it wasn't suitable to us, because we'd lost it in our routing, now becomes available to, for us to use, providing we know how to safely use it, which is what the information you get. So a simple example is, you know, you might, um, it might be optimum to smell small blocks information over the DSL link, because in general, the, the latency is much smaller. But if I have to send a big block, I can open up a 4G, pay the penalty of the extra, extra G, but the S is so much smaller that the block will get there faster. Right? And that, you know, if, for, if you go and take that to your network engineers, uh, that would just basically, they'll all sort of just call, curl up, grab, their, grab their, um, their knees and rock back and forth gently. Right? Because they'll become catatonic in that process. Because suddenly you've given them complexity they really can't deal with. And what I'm saying is it just falls out in the wash. Right? This is just purely a matrix calculation, you know? You teach, you teach A-level kids how to do matrices. It's no more difficult than that, and then making a pick. Right, so we're doing this, we're doing that, we're doing this. And then you can choose which one you're gonna do. So what's, what's interesting to me is, we, we were doing this, we started working with this cryptocurrency, you know, with, the, with Cardano and IOHK, to look at the issue of large-scale performance because it was clear that if the performance was too bad, then that would affect the performance of these systems. What we're basically finding is we can go and take the existing public infrastructure, right, find alternative routes in it, um, find better ways of which route to use for which size packet, work out a whole bunch of mitigations for attacks because we can reason about, uh, if I send a packet out this way and the network's gone down, uh, I should have seen it back come back over here. I should have said, if, if I send a block out this way, I should see an indication of the block from this peer over here within a certain amount of time, which I can calculate. And if that's not true, I know something's gone wrong. Right? And the first uh, you know, essential thing for making a mitigation action is detecting the fact that you need to mitigate in some way. We, we've talked about Delta Q in the real details. We talk, what I was trying to give here was, I, you know, people have asked me, how do you take an application and look at it? What we've done here is taken this application, which is actually coming back from here, quickly. Dun, 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 dun. This application, right, which we have looked at this particular part by here, worked out how much we can do. We can measure, and these are actually, we're doing more than debt measuring. Um, what we're actually doing is in incorporating these into things called a process algebra so we can predict and manage these objects. So we don't can't just measure this stuff and work out how it will work. We can, actually we can actually incorporate these numbers in the delta Q as we start. And we've turned this whole problem into something that we can now put numbers on, uh, budgets on, and give to, you know, the network team this problem. Uh, the, the core team was doing the issues of how you do uh, transaction in the logic layer, this particular problem, and say, please try and reduce the amount of time you're consuming, the resources you're consuming, and by the way, if you can get it down by this much, we will all be much happier because we can go around this loop instead of 20 seconds in 10. 
and suddenly we have doubled the throughput of the system. Right? And I mean, we, we were, we've been talking also about using the, the, one of the things that I'm, you know, one of the things that's interesting about information and quantification um, is if you can construct appropriate metrics that have appropriate meaning, uh, right, you can do a couple of things. One is you can engage, you can split the vertical problems and the horizontal problems into manageable groups, right, because this is about giving people budgets. The other thing is you can define layers in which the, you know, the, the, the management chain can be managed over, and then you've got fungibility, as they say in the trade. You can actually replace things with other things. Right. Nobody's, nobody's having a go at me, so here we go. Quiet. Last one. So, we're, we're, you know, we're currently, what we're, currently what we do is saying, that we talked about all the practical measurement things. The fun stuff for me as a computer scientist is I can now de-risk my application developments. I can basically write things down in an afternoon. I can think about them over a cup of tea, and I can work out roughly how they'll perform to, shall we say, one or two decimal places, right? And know whether the solution I have proposed is one that's viable. And then if I don't like that universe of discourse, I can move on to another one, to half a dozen of them, still be home in time for tea. Right? Right? This is always by joke. The, the joke with, when I work with people at CERN is I could do half a dozen universes a day. They just had one. I thought I was in a better position. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay? Um, we can use this. So what we're doing here is we're not just reasoning about the application of performance, but we can, we can actually reason about how many of those blocks will be too late. Right? So now I can start reasoning about the system integrity, right? which is, you know, this is what coming to that station. It does, what I just tried to illustrate here, and I realize it's a high level view, we can talk about the numbers, exactly what you do, I just try to illustrate how the information is flowing, how the delta Q becomes that information you flow around your design, around your build, so that you can construct these highly distributed systems. And we are talking a highly distributed system that has min will have minted I don't know, hundreds of thousands of blocks at this point. It's in its 14th epoch, and an epoch is 21,600 or 26,100. Can't remember slots. Multiply that by 20. That's, a, you know, that, that's the time it's been running, right? Um, it's, it, it, the daft thing about this stuff, and I don't understand it at all, is the value for this stuff. To the, to the people perceive the value of this. That's the only thing I can say in terms of the, the capitalization of this system. It started off at a quarter of a cent an ADA, which is what the unit of currency here, right? Um, when it was first launched, it, it, when it was launched, it was 2.4 cents an ADA, I think. That was in October. Suddenly it went up, and that was a mere half billion dollars capitalization. And then something happened which none of us understand, but people got interested in it, and suddenly it was 12 cents an ADA. Three, four billion capitalization. That happened in 36 hours. Right? The system scaled, the system grew. Um, there was a few little alarms went off that the CPU was a bit busy over here, right? Oh, so the other thing I failed to mention is because you've done this approach, you know the key metrics you have to manage to, because you know what's going to affect the outcome, and therefore you ignore some metrics. You'd have a bit of a panic, and they say, oh, that's not important. Right, so it creates this basis for constructing high integrity dis 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 distributed systems which we've all agreed is an essential part for our, our, just our lives, human infrastructure it, uh, as we go on. And it enables, for the, for the real network nerds, it enables new ways of thinking of using the underlying resource. So I would argue there's a lot of unused asset sitting out there that can be done and used and used in better ways, which is good for the people who've paid for those assets and bad for the people who think they're going to sell new ones into those, those people. Thank you.